BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 202, Mood, Memory, and Menopause, Part 1. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. This week, Dr. Maupin and I are going to be talking about differences between men and women in terms of brain function and hormone function. We got interested in this topic uh, recently in efforts to promote our book and spread our message. We were in Orlando, Florida for a medical conference, and uh, Dr. Maupin was given a speech about testosterone in females at the conference, and we were selling our book. But while we were there, we had an opportunity to attend a number of other presentations, and one of them was presented by a Dr. Hyla Cass, uh, and she was talking about uh, mood and memory and perimenopausal and menopausal women. That was the Mm -hmm. title of her uh, her speech. And so we've taken notes from her notes. So a lot of the things that we're going to reference come pretty directly from what she had to say. She has a book. But but then we're going to discuss our take on that, Mm -hmm. and particularly because uh, and we've done other podcasts on this. If you're interested in the topic, you can go back and, and pull those up as well. But until very recently, all medical research was done on on males. Even in the animal kingdom, for the most part, mm-hmm. they use male uh, yes. volunteers. Uh, <laughs> in the animal kingdom. Yeah. Okay. Well, the leading cause of death uh, among uh, laboratory rats is research. <laughs> so yep. they have not included women in medical testing for uh, societal reasons, cultural reasons, and because of concerns about possible pregnancies and mm-hmm. any impact on an unknown fetus that exists. You know, if you give some medicine as, mm-hmm. a, as a trial drug and say, well, what does this do? And you turn out to be a month pregnant, that could cause mm-hmm. you know, serious concerns. So there's some legitimacy to that. But there also has been the philosophy that women are just littler men who are more complicated because they have these hormone fluctuations that men don't have. Mm -hmm. And part of what we're going to be talking about is that none of that is true. (laughs) Maybe many women are littler than men, but men and women both have hormones that have complications and fluctuations, uh, and most of those hormones are exactly the same, like testosterone that we discussed in our book. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go through and talk about starting with the impact on the brain. Uh, and differences in the male and female brain and the way that they function and the way they metabolize medicines and the way they run the body system. Which changes how drugs that we take are used. Yes. So if all the research is done on men Mm -hmm. and then women are given these medications, they aren't really structured for women. Well, like the metabolic half-life. You know, Mm -hmm. and I'm blanking now uh, on the one we talked about. Mm -hmm. but. Some of the prescriptions that you take, to help, like Ambien, to help you mm-hmm. sleep, right. women metabolize it at about half the speed that men Which metabolize it. Which means they it. don't really wake up. They're they just don't really, really wake tired up, and they morning. get dressed, and they go out and drive to work, and they're half in a stupor. And so then they get all these jokes about women drivers or about women, yuck, yuck, yuck. And nobody understood that the medicine was still in them, and mm-hmm. they were still pretty heavily medicated where men wouldn't be. Right. And the, and and. That's what's wrong with not looking at weight <laughs> and gender when you're prescribing a one-size-fits-all drug. Yes. And we've talked about this before, too, that, like, my 250-pound uh, husband shouldn't be taking the same dose as I am. Right. In terms of antidepressants or um, antibiotics, even. I always have to give him two double dose of antibiotics to get rid of any kind of lung infection or any kind of infection. He needs twice as much as what is recommended. So having said that, I think they fall short in not only not only gender differences in drugs, but also size difference. Because there are some men who are who are five eight and a hundred and 50 pounds. Well, and lifestyle differences. Uh, he smokes cigars. And unlike Bill Clinton, he inhales. You don't smoke he does, cigars. He only smokes cigars on vacation. Well, but even so, <laughs> that can that, affect, especially mm-hmm. if you're dealing with lung issues. That's true. Uh, so you look at lifestyle, you look at size, you look at gender, you mm-hmm. look at metabolic function. 
And that's what we're going to be talking about. And, and in general, the only places in medicine that that's looked at, not gender, but size, is pediatrics and anesthesia. Yeah. So pediatrics always has a dose per kilogram. And then, so that has to be figured. And and in anesthesia, of course, you have to go by your, your weight, your height. I remember when my son, who's 19 now, was an infant, we were concerned about his growth curve. You know, where does he fall on the curve? And every time we go to the pediatrician, she'd get out her little growth curve chart, or it was on her mm -hmm. computer eventually, and it, it would plot a graph for where he was and where normal was. And, mm -hmm. and uh, she even sent us to the hospital one time to have his hand x-rayed mm -hmm. because the best determinant that they had for whether or not there was going to be a, a normal growth range was the growth rate of the, the growth plate. The, plate. the growth plate that's, at the very end of the yeah. of the wrist. Yeah. And that that's what we used to do. That's how we found out if someone was growing appropriately. Yeah. That, that was all new to me, and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. and so those things I don't know. And those are things that we should probably carry over, not the growth, but, but we're done growing when we're adults. But we should carry over the weight and dose, but we really don't look at that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it's too hard for us to remember all those different doses for the different weights. But I have to think of that when I do. be computerized. When I do, t I know it should I mean, there should just be a chart. You should weigh chart. 152 pounds. Right. This is so you take, if you weigh what I weigh, you, you take. Uh, 250 of Cipro. So if you're high, if you're bigger, then you take 500. If you're bigger than that, then you take. I mean, there is. So would that be a, an argument for compound pharmacies and relationships with doctors? Because I have to say, figure out somebody's I need to get dose. you a pill for this amount based yes. on your. Uh, yes, but when I look at, at dosages, I look. I do look at the sex difference because men need 10 times as much testosterone as women. Right. So I look at that, but I also look at that the unknown of how fast is their liver metabolizing. In other words, if they're on five drugs that go through their, that go yes. through their liver. And if they drink more than 10 drinks a week, then they're going to have of alcohol. They're right. going to have to ha have a higher dose because they're going to go through this faster. And so they're going to have to be know dosed more about often. Their lifestyle. Right. And we ask them that, yeah. But we ask the and and how often they work out. So when we're dosing, it's actually a better dosing because we're looking at their whole person to dose a hormone. Or I can tell you that I'm fooled every once in a while. Sometimes a person who has five medications and they all go through the liver in the same system didn't speed up the liver enzymes. Somehow they so they'll have a higher level at the end of four months or six months, but but this is just something that I have to go through. There's always unknowns, right? But for for most medications, you have to look at the other medications someone's on to decide how to dose them. If you're doing it by gender and by weight, which is what I have to do. Well. And but another, the, but the, the FDA gender doesn't issue. do You're that. You're talking about the mechanics of gender, the physiology of gender. I tend to be more interested in the psychology of gender. Mm -hmm. And as a man, I'm much more likely, most of the men I know, to say, well, if one of these is good, two is going to be better. <laughs> that's why I put them under the skin where you can't get them. <laughs> that's why, I mean, that's that's the uh, the problem with, I mean... Not the problem with Viagra, but the problem with the men taking Viagra mm -hmm. is instead of taking one, they take two, and then yeah, and then they have more than and they need. You get needed. that four-hour erection that you have to go to the hospital for, or eight-hour, or yeah, ten-hour, or whatever. Painful, so, painful, <laughs> painful, painful. So, so that's that is kind of the intricacies of pharmacology, and we've tried to make one size fits all, but honestly, in America, if you look around, one size does not fit all. Certainly not. No. If you just look at different body types and maybe in different co countries that are more homogenous in terms of their genetics, it might be, but not, but certainly not here. We're right. the melting pot. So when we're talking about differences in the brain, in the brain, we're talking about different, a different size and also a different uh, anatomy because women have a uh, bigger cl corpus callosum, which is that, that Division. It's a tube that connects the two halves. Yeah, it's kind of, of the like brain. a yeah. It's There's kind two of, hemispheres. Of the it's brain. like a pass through. Yeah. It's but I, it's not exactly a tube, but it, it's like a yeah. It's a highway in between the two it's hemispheres. A neuronal connection. Yes, it is. But multiple neurons. Yeah. Neurons. <laughs> so, uh, in any case, <laughs> gotcha. this 
Thank you. So um, for women, we have a much larger corpus callosum. So we multitask better. We were kind of built for that. So both sides of our brain can work our logical side and our artistic side at the same time. Now, some women more than it's more always, than others, always. but um, there are always individual variations. But this is one of the things that makes us able to watch multiple children. And then when we leave our one child home with our one husband, he has no idea where she is. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's just, it's, one of those things that we were kind of, we either evolved to or we were built for. So having said all of that, we have different kinds of neurologic illnesses than men do. And that's, and we need different kinds of neurologic treatment. So that's one of the things that Hyla was talking about. Dr. Cass was talking about, she had, we have a higher level of depression mm -hmm. and we'll discuss why that is. We have a higher level of uh, hypothyroidism. We have a, we have more fatigue or more complaint of fatigue. Maybe men don't want to complain about it. Mm -hmm. um, you hardly ever hear a man discuss brain fog, although women talk about it all the time. That they they just they can't remember something or they're they're in a fog. Right. Many of these things are, as we've talked about before, secondary to hormones. And our, well, and, our hormones and the being cultural imagery, cultural messages. Failing. Men are not supposed to be. We're so competitive, and we're constantly juggling our perception as it's as it's emanated uh, among other men in particular. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm not going to go around my colleagues and competitors at work and talk about being in a brain fog all the time because that'll give them a leg up on me in terms of sharpness and acuity and mm -hmm. promotability or sales success or, or whatever. It's not a man thing. And and women are much more willing to say, I just can't, I'm stuck, I don't know. You know and it's culturally more acceptable among women to talk about those things. Oh. The same thing about their feelings, about being sad or depressed. Mm -hmm. Men don't articulate that to one another. You know, if I'm playing golf and somebody says, oh, you're really off your game. You know, you usually are, are driving better than that. What's wrong? And I go, I'm depressed. <laughs> yeah, you don't hear that much. No. <laughs> no, because then they give you grief. Well, hell, if I was shooting those shots, I'd be depressed too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or, or maybe you need a better club. If you had a bigger club, you know, I'd be depressed if my club was that small. I mean, there's a lot of that garbage with, with men. Well, it's a good thing women don't do that stuff. Women, I don't think women they just, do. Women just talk Although about it Although they dress for each other. They don't dress for do. men. No, we dress for everybody. They dress for all the other women to go, meow. See, you you're not a so? woman. We dress for ourselves. <sighs> we want to look good. <sighs> and we don't care who we're looking good for. We just, that's part of our confidence. That's part of our, who we are. Yeah. And some of us don't care. And some of us do. And some of us love clothes. So that would and be me. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 many of these in my when she was giving this list yes i kept thinking well that's testosterone loss and that's testosterone loss and that and and women have testosterone loss earlier than men so there's more of us we're still alive mm -hmm. and we're without testosterone so we have many of these problems secondary to our testosterone loss after 40 and sometimes even earlier i'm finding in some of my patients so when, when she calls these perimenopausal symptoms, right. I find that to be a misnomer, like I talk about in the book. Yes. Perimenopause means right around menopause, mm. which would make everyone think it's right around 50. But perimenopause symptoms are all about testosterone loss, which happen after 40. Right. There's a big 10-year gap in there between the symptoms starting and menopause, and it doesn't even, it does has nothing to do with the same hormone. Menopause is a loss of estradiol, and what they're talking about perimenopausal symptoms is a loss of testosterone, which we call testosterone deficiency syndrome. Right. So we named it something different so that it was distinct. To get away and, from the confusion of perimenopausal, mm -hmm. because that's a, a, an elaborately undefined term. On purpose. It's, it's a catch-all term. You know, so oh, that they didn't have, be, you don't have to no. define it. I mean, if you define it, then you'd have to treat it. Mm -hmm. So then if you treated it, then you'd have to know what caused it. So then you'd have to do research. And so they're they're really not interested in that part. Well, I mean, OBGYN 
uh, the endocrinologists are. But. Go, go back to my field, psychology. They, there's a diagnosis called uh, hysterical personality disorder, and it's called hysteria or hysterical it can only because be. it goes back to the Greeks who tracked mood fluctuations in women that they thought were caused by tidal changes and fluid changes in the tides because women have tides in their bodies and have monthly tides. Hyster. Yeah. Only women can be hysterical. Exactly. So, so so you don't get men diagnosed with that. You're right. You but, don't. And that's But I've seen a few hysterical men. I have too. But that's not something you're diagnosed with. Right. And it's still out there. That's right. part of it's, it's a part DSM of the cultural myth. And it's a DSM classification. Yes. Which is ladies crazy. If yeah. you guys somebody doesn't stand up for that in the psychiatric area, that's that just shouldn't be, no. honestly. We're all moving away from it. Yeah, someday, it gets, it gets someday we'll all be equal. So, um, <laughs> so well, but no, we won't because of what you're talking about here. The, for instance, you're saying, or Dr. Cass, I don't saying, mean the same. I said equal. We're not the same. Okay, well, we're not the same. Is that a distinction without a difference? No, we're not the same, but equal in how we're treated by medicine. Okay. That's okay. not. That's I'll what buy I that one. All right. So I didn't mean equal as in we'll be wearing. You know, pants and a jacket and a right. golf shirt. And smoking I'm, a big cigar. Yeah. That's not, that's not, joie de la différence, <laughs> or viva la différence. That's exactly. It. So, um, so much for all that French I took. Anyway, um, many of these presenting problems are, women's problems are testosterone loss. And yes, testosterone is a woman's hormone. Yes. So, we have to look at both the uh, conventional treatments for these, which are symptomatic treatments. The conventional treatments are, oh, you're depressed, here's an antidepressant, mm -hmm. which means they're going to increase the hormone serotonin or norepinephrine to make people feel happy. But they're not going to solve the real underlying problem, which is usually when you get this after 40, loss of testosterone after 40, which causes depression. Or, so, so they can go in and identify that your like give you an SSRI, uh, an antidepressant, an antidepressant that is a serotonin mm -hmm. reuptake inhibitor, mm -hmm. so that when in the brain messages flow across uh, what's called a synaptic cleft, where, where two nerve endings come together mm -hmm. and there's a gap, there's fluid in the gap, and the little nerve messenger leaves this one, swims across, and is taken up mm -hmm. by this one. Mm -hmm. And if that fluid in the gap isn't the right consistency of the right chemicals doesn't have enough that serotonin. doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so what they've identified is that fact. So they do things to try to increase the serotonin mm -hmm. so that the reuptake on the other side, the, the message gets through. Mm -hmm. But what Perfect. you're saying is that's the wrong end of the stick, mm -hmm. that if they checked the testosterone, that was, the free testosterone that was available in the bloodstream. That goes to the brain. That goes through the brain that that would stimulate serotonin and therefore you wouldn't need that antidepressant that's right and if you diagnose depression right. as not just a symptom we're going to treat if you diagnose right. it and say well what exactly causes is it testosterone deficiency is it another hormonal deficiency do you have cortisol excess do you have cortisol deficiency like adrenal fatigue or do you have thyroid deficiency, which can cause depression as well? So in st they're just skipping the step of diagnosis. So as a physician. And saying, to, this is depression, and here's how we're going to treat it. Because, honestly, that's what patients want. They just want to get it over with faster. Right, right. You know, let's get past this. Give me but something for my headache. It may not be all patients. Right. But in my mind, it's not as good a treatment as treating the cause of it. So if, as a physician in training, are you taught decision tree matrices yeah and it, yes so, in so general. Uh, how do you make guidelines you go here first then you go here then you go here then yes. you go here mm -hmm. and there's a flow and a process mm -hmm. that tells you where to branch if you have three of these symptoms and four of these symptoms mm -hmm. you look at this first right so because we're taught that in psychology mm -hmm. with, the, with the dsm to to come up with a diagnostic label that is appropriately descriptive, you have a decision tree. Do they have this? Do they have that? But they mm -hmm. don't have this, but they have that. And and so then you get two or three options, and you decide among those options which seems to be the most appropriate diagnostic label. Right. Do you do a similar thing as you try to figure <clears throat> out a treatment? Except yes. that what, well, what you and Dr. Cass are saying of, is they, they identify the symptom of complaint. 
but they didn't dis but they didn't find the reason the patient right, they didn't was go depressed. back up the tree now they just came in at the complaint point you have many reasons people can be depressed right from life or just yes. inherently endogenous genetic or exogenous and endogenous right. could be from their inheritance they just don't have as much serotonin right. or it could be from loss of testosterone or lack of thyroid right. or right Any lack of, of cortisol so i'm looking at a if a cause for that what we call a, a disease now right. and i'm looking for a disease that causes the disease and they're taking the shortcut and right. just looking Treating at this as a one. disease and sometimes that works right and sometimes it doesn't work and when it doesn't work we have to go backwards and find out what the cause of that depression was when we can't find a treatment for it so so medically is that a triage kind of thing let's deal with your depression with this medicine, if it if it subsides, and if it doesn't, then we have to look further. Honestly, when I was trained, it was find the thyroid, find because we didn't have good antidepressants. Right. So. Oh. Okay. It was you know if you had if you had high cholesterol or if you had depression, we went back and looked at thyroid because many times it was low thyroid. Okay. So then we could, we knew how to treat thyroid, so we replaced the thyroid hormone, and then the depression got better and the cholesterol got better. So that's how I was trained, but but now with the advent of a new drug, right. we've got we've got a whole line of antidepressants that don't have the same and ha doctors same side often effects. now no longer check the thyroid. Right, they just move to the antidepressants, and they're not really trained to do that. Right, they're trained to do the fastest, easiest thing that will make somebody better. So the key, ladies and gentlemen, is always find an old doctor. <laughs> <laughs> no, find a find a doctor who's actually looking for the reason. Yes, looking for the reason that you're depressed or anxious or um, have some other. It could it could even be fibromyalgia or or some an autoimmune disorder. Chronic fatigue syndrome. Go look go yeah. look for the reason you have that, and sometimes you can find it, and sometimes you can't. But having said that, we do know a lot of causes for these these illnesses, and we know how to treat them in a way that's not just symptomatic treatment. Right. Now you, the, she goes through a list, and you were talking about mm -hmm. one, antidepressants, neuroleptics, anti-anxiety mm -hmm. medicines. Sometimes they're given in combination because the anxiety and the depression are comorbid. Yes. And, but often one is less visible than the other. So mm -hmm. they treat the most visible one first if you're mm -hmm. having panic attacks. They get those under control with symptomatic treatment mm -hmm. of the right anti-panic medicine, then the depression manifests. I mean, that's right. not at all rare. Yeah, and you uh, see that. You would see that more often than I. Yeah. But I so, see I see the patient coming in with an anti-anxiety and an antidepressant right. who has no testosterone and no thyroid. You're going back up And I'm going backwards, and I'm so. saying, hmm, maybe we can replace these. Let's see how right. you do. If we can replace these and you feel better overall, then maybe we can decrease your anti-anxiety and anti-depressant. Well, and that happens pretty regularly. We talk about that in our book, and we talk about that when we give presentations uh, around the country. But what we always want to say to, to patients is don't make these decisions unilaterally. Mm -hmm. If you're on an antidepressant and you get testosterone replacement and you feel better, don't just go off your antidepressant. Talk to your regular prescribing physician mm -hmm. about your symptoms, about your feelings, Hopefully and, they'll know about Kathy's treatments, mm -hmm. and together the team, you and their mm -hmm. doctor and they, can make that decision. And you don't just stop them. You don't just stop. So no. never just stop an no. antidepressant or an anti-anxiety. You'll go through various kinds of withdrawals that and, are very uncomfortable. And then you could think those were some other right. issue. Right. So always go through removing a medication with the doctor, just like getting a medication. Yes. So it's that's very important. But having having said all of these things, it's really a good idea to to see if you can ask your doctor, so why am I depressed? It may be genetic. Right. But it, then again, it may be because some other imbalance is, is occurring or a deficiency of a hormone as you age. So maybe that should be checked out. Well, and remember, too, and your doctor should know this, uh, but it's, it's worth mentioning. A lot of times, severe clinical depression occurs because of external events in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, those external events can be so traumatizing 
that they actually reset your body chemistry. Mm -hmm. And so as you would normally go past a, a grief period, Mm -hmm. You know, so your, your wife dies and you're grieving and it's really appropriate and you're just blown away and, and devastated and depressed. Uh, society will roughly say, well, about a year you should be coming out of that, which is BS and, and, <laughs> and wrong. But that's what they say. Uh, and so somebody may say, well, you should be over that by now or you should be better by now. Part of why you may not be better is that your body chemistry has changed mm -hmm. and you need that chemical restoration that you get from medicine. Mm -hmm. So when you talk to your doctor and say, well, why am I depressed? And they check thyroid or they check testosterone and those are all fine and the antidepressants are helping, but you don't want to be on them uh, or you think everybody thinks it's, it's long enough now, mm -hmm. maybe we should come off. Uh, they will factor in the circumstance of your life mm -hmm. and the loss in that discussion and that decision matrix, and they should, which is why you talk to them about it. That's right, because they really did go to school and learn all of <laughs> all this, that stuff. and you can't just learn it on the Internet. There's so many intricacies that you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. I mean, part of this is we are on the Internet. We're trying to I inform you. I saw a thing you. on the Internet the other day that said uh, <laughs> people who eat broccoli are happier than people who don't. So if one of my depressed clients reads that and starts eating tons of broccoli, they're not going to be happier. But they'll probably go off their antidepressants and, and then eat, eat broccoli, broccoli, and that's not a good answer. Right. We're not advocating this at all. No. We're saying... <laughs> We're saying don't get your medicine uh, <laughs> medical advice from the Internet. Right. Talk to a professional. And and we're yeah, and we're trying to get you to talk to your professionals that, yes. that you know. And you can ask them questions, but... Uh, in general, it's our responsibility to take care of you. So what we're going to do is come back in our next podcast and talk about the physiology uh, of symptoms of, of mood problems. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to talk through a list of hormones that are both male and female. They're mm -hmm. human hormones. But from the perspective of how those hormones manifest symptomatically in women mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to men. Right. So come back next time for that conversation. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.